Hey guys, don't forget the 2023 Street Cop Training Conference, Nashville, Tennessee, April 23rd through the 28th. You do not want to miss this so far. Guest speakers, Rob O'Neill, the Navy SEAL that was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden. Kyle Carpenter, U.S. Marine, Medal of Honor recipient, jumping on an IED to protect his platoon. Fox News host Tommy Lahren returns for 2023. Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff Mark Lamb, Sheriff David Clark, and more to come. You don't want to miss this event. We additionally have 20 of the country's top law enforcement educators giving you the best experience of your life. You will leave this event knowing more about your job and how to be proficient at the things that you do, hands down, than any other event that you'll ever attend. I personally guarantee it. Don't miss out. There's a room code at streetcop.com for our room block and room code at the Gaylord at Opry is where the event's taking place. Don't miss out on a discounted rate. The rate is from Sunday to Thursday. Put that in and find yourselves at a half-price room. Split it with a friend, but make sure you get there. You don't want to miss this event. It is going to be that good. If you trust me and you trust Street Cop, trust that you will leave there feeling like you've had an experience of a lifetime. You trying to be a Street Cop? Hell yeah. tell, the, tell the street cop nation who you are, Tony Cowden. A lot of people know who you are already, but yeah, what's up, man? Tony Cowden here, um, owner of Capable Incorporated, mostly an instructor these days, still doing some stuff here and there overseas. Um, I was an SF guy, went to work for one of the three letter agencies, um, one of the intelligence agencies, and I've done some other stuff here and there for some of the other three letter, letter agencies over the years. I try to, well, in every course I teach, man, I give a free spot to a law dog, a scholarship is what I call it. Um, I always, this would be a good place to let guys know most of the time that scholarship goes unfilled uh, just wow. because sometimes guys can't get ammo or maybe I don't, I don't put it out there well enough uh, or often enough uh, in my busyness. But yeah, man, freaking always try to let, let guys know because the way I look at it is officers who are seeking additional training tend to be the good guys you know guys who are proactive you know in their own training their own lives you know that whole next step of the old the, the serve and protect you know if guys you know i, I did a uh, a course back after the texas shooting thing a, a free class to sros and when that didn't feel we opened it to any law dogs and i think we had like 17 or 18 guys and gals show up and they're all just like, holy crap, man. We've never even heard of half of this, these techniques, you know, and, 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 you know, you got officers that couldn't hit a human sized target at, you know, 25 meters at the beginning of the class walking away, you know, 10 out of 10 hits and stuff like that under the time limits and all that. So we try really, really hard to give back to you guys, you know, as well, the, the taxpayers paid for most of my training. So, you know, I look at it, you know, we just give back. It's not a, it's not a hard thing because, you know, when I'm, when I'm gone, if Melissa, my girlfriend picks up the phone and calls one of my law dog buddies for help, I want them to be able to come with a quickness and with the skills, you know, they need to help her with whatever it is, you know, it might just be getting the cat out of the tree. Wait, no, that's for the heroes. Uh, Y'all don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, man, it's, it's a, uh, you know, we're all we're all toting guns for a living. So, you know, um, if somehow or another over the years I'm afforded a little bit cooler training or better training or maybe a little bit more up to date training than a lot of, you know, I mean, I get it, right? The military is just as bad. Sometimes it won't flex and update its training, and it's the same with uh, with all you guys is training too. You know, sometimes it's it's not keeping up with the times. You know, we see it, and especially with the hard skills, right? The whether it's hand to hand or shooting or whatever, you know? So if I can give back, man, it's too easy. It's too easy. If people want to find that free spot, where can they find that? So basically what I say is it's first come first serve. So, you know, the, the website is capable incorporated.com. And, um, you know, if I post a class, like right now, I think I have three or four classes scheduled and I don't think a single one of those scholarship spots have been claimed. And it's just literally all an officer has to do is hit me up email through the contact page on the website is best. A lot of times guys try to DM me on Instagram. You know, these days it's hard for me to keep up with the DM. So I always say, Hey man, you want positive contact, go through the website and just say, Hey, I'd like to claim that spot. 
And if it hasn't been, that's just how easy it is. Like Roger that I give them, I give guys a, uh, a coupon code to register for the class. It makes it zero dollars. Well, I have a funny feeling these classes are going to get claimed now. We have 411,000 subscribers to the podcast at the moment. So I think it's over for, uh, for that, yeah. that being a problem. Yeah, no, that's good stuff, man. And I don't care you know where guys come from or if it's a travel class or one of the classes here, here at, uh, you know, our place at North Carolina. It's awesome, man. That's really cool. What does that class consist of? What do your courses look like? Most of the time when I travel, it'll be a two day class, a pistol class and a carving class. Uh, an officer can opt for one or the other or both. I don't care. You know what I mean? And heck, if one officer just wants to do a pistol, another officer wants to do a carbine, we're going to be flexing. Uh, and it is, it's how to shoot. I don't get too, too wrapped up around a lot of tactical stuff, right? You know, you're not going to shoot from your back or under a car in one of my classes, but you're going to shoot. And because it's always grip sights trigger, I don't care if you're hanging upside down from a space shuttle, you know what I mean? It's shooting, shooting. A, you know, the, the application of the techniques will be situational. And while, yeah, you should practice leaning around barricades and stuff like that or around your vehicle or over your vehicle, you know, a lot of people consider that to be tactical shooting. It's still grip sights trigger. So I try to focus really hard on those skill sets um, as opposed to, you know, making it tactical per se. Of course, we also do long range, right? My passion has always been the sniper rec a mission. And since I've started doing less and less uh, overseas deployments, I've gotten more and more back into the long range stuff. Uh, we were lucky enough to secure a piece of property, to put a one mile range in. So we have one of the very few over a thousand meter ranges on the East Coast here in North Carolina. And um, again, shooting is shooting. So if you've got your designated marksmen or your snipers for your SWAT teams or whatever, you know, they can take a, a spot in that class as well. You know, like I said, it, it, I don't care if you're a competition PRS guy or a military sniper or police sniper or just somebody that wants to shoot an elk at 600 meters. If, if that's where that elk is standing, long range is long range. Um, you know, of course, you got to get into start talking about shooting through glass and stuff like that when you're talking police and military. But, you know, that's that's a whole different thing. And it's really not that difficult. So, you know, we, we'll do typically one day. Um, We'll do one day intro to long range classes, which is all shooting from your belly, uh, from the prone. And then our two day classes gets guys on their tripods and in positions, uh, the more practical applications, mm -hmm. if you will. And um, lots of times, you know, it's every class of mine is different. You know, like in a long range class, if I've got, you know, four out of six dudes are military or law dog uh, snipers, then we'll pull the vehicles out in front of the berm and set up freaking, you know, vehicle uh, tripod positions and stuff like that. You know, I, I will tailor to my audience and let's face it. If I have a couple of guys who are just there for shooting for fun, they're like, hell yeah, let's shoot from vehicles. I'm over here going, I don't want that overpressure, but if y'all do, I'll stand outside, you know, uh, whatever, man. That's one of the cool thing about our classes. Guys will tell you, you know, guys who have been to more than one of our classes are like, everyone in your classes is different. And I'm like, yeah, it's because of how fast, the crew is progressing. So if I have a drill and everybody's smoking it, we're not going to continue to work on that. We're moving on. So in some of my classes, we get through all kinds of information. Other classes might be newer shooters who, you know, don't, don't get to shooting on the move or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, that that's one thing that, that we really take pride on that. We're not really, we're, we're teaching. We have a sequence of drills but we don't have like an exact loadout for each one. We're not going to shoot, you know, a reload drill this exact amount of times. Like if everybody's got it, we're moving on, you know? Um, and, and that's, that's one thing that, that guys really seem to report back that they like about our courses is just how we're a little more flexible or whatever. I like having officers in the class too. And, and, you know, we do some discussions here and there while guys are jamming up mags and everything. And, you know, it gives civilians an opportunity, you know, to talk to different law enforcement guys from around the country, you know, and especially with guys coming down from up north to train, you know, and we're down here in the south where like everybody has guns all the time. The guys from up north, you know, it usually spurs a really good, you know, two A type conversation. Um, you know, if I got my couple of guys down from Jersey or New York, you know, and vice versa, 
You know, if I've got civilians from New York or Massachusetts or wherever, and we've got law dogs down here, you know, they can just answer those questions. It's always great conversation and networking. That's another huge, huge plus I always see is, you know, students and attendees of our classes leave with new best friends, <laughs> you know, they extend that network. Um, and that's one of the, one of the best things, one of the coolest things about doing open enrollment classes is how many friendships are forged over the years, you know? It's cool, man. We had a podcast recently and, uh, one of our instructors brought you up. I don't know if you'll remember him, so I didn't want to say his name unless you want me to. I just want to embarrass him on the podcast. Frank, you can edit this shit out. No, you, you can. I, I might. You know, I've got a couple bumps in my head. So my freaking memory sucks. <laughs> but, yeah, but Rich, Rich Bruno. Of course. No, I know that, man. I talked to Rich quite often and been up there and shot with him a couple of times, man. No, yeah, Rich is one of our instructors here. He's taking his own company and just launched it, right? Doing the, yeah, the dude, excellent job uh, training folks. Yeah, no, good people, man. I like Rich a lot. Yeah, Rich is a good dude. Oh, he's yeah. here all the time. So he's one of our street cop instructors. Now he does his own thing a little bit, and then he does more stuff with us now. Okay. Uh, but he's a great yeah. dude, man. I know uh, Kyle Morgan was going up the train in y'all's area a few months ago, maybe two months ago or whatever, and I gave him Rich's number. I was like, hey, man, reach out to these guys, you know? Yeah, hell yeah. I'm gathering that you've been in some shootings. You don't have to elaborate on any of that stuff. That's fine, whatever you want to talk about. But the question I have gathering this information taking a educated guess at it what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from being in those experiences like let's talk about when you were new involved in that shit versus when you were seasoned and what changed and what allowed you to change and i think there's value in that so people can hear this and say okay yeah i've never been in a shooting i'm anticipating i'm going to feel like tony did the first time but if i can yeah. understand what i'm going to some of the principles he learned as he went on at the end of his uh, maybe s more frequent opportunities to be in some gun battles, what are those principles oh, from when you started yeah, to now at the end? Yeah, I, I, I talk to folks about this quite often. It's a very common question. It's different when you're on the offensive. It's just different. Uh, and, and typically, you know, even SWAT officers, right? Like it's a different mission when you're trying to arrest someone. Right. Which we do that, too. Right. There are sometimes we have missions where we're going to capture. It's not not shoot everybody on the target. Right. Um, so it is very similar to an arrest. Right. It's the same thing with detaining. But my first gunfights were all offensive, offensive and fairly decent distances in Afghanistan. It wasn't. So it was like I kind of got to, you know, quote unquote, pop that cherry, not in a traffic stop, close proximity, not in a home defense or ATM mugging um, scenario, right? It wasn't a, a self-defense thing. It wasn't defense at all. You know, it was some react to contact, but it was just enough buffer to kind of, okay, you know, I know what it sounds like now, you know, to have rounds crack, you know, I know what it's like to have, you know, one of the, one situation we got in Afghanistan right off the bat when I was just, you know, the, first initial evasion um you know some rounds hit our vehicle and you know one of the rounds went through my headrest and it was like oh, hey, shit what was that <laughs> you know so i got a lot of that initial nervousness that um you know whatever the different you know colors that we're using red and black and all that stuff you know that that excitement that heart rate uh got that out of my system before february Actually, it was last week of January, uh, 02. So Afghanistan's still new, right? We've toppled the government. Um, tour board's done and over with. You know, we killed a bunch of people in Al-Qaeda, you know, the Al-Qaeda folks there. And we lots of bombs being dropped and stuff. And guys aren't shooting that much. But in January, we started to shift a little bit. The direct action forces started hitting targets and really hunting down individuals and pockets of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, so on and so forth. My team is headed into Sarubi, the Sarubi area of Afghanistan to do searches of these dams, right? Huge hydroelectric type dams, right? You know, hundreds of rooms, but it took us like three days of quote unquote CQB. Um, Cause I don't know, we were basically just, we realized that, you know, when we first started hitting, it, it was like all dynamic and whatever and kicking in doors and stuff. And then by the end of it, it was basically just opening doors and looking around, you know, because we found out that these dams weren't being used like, 
like had been reported. Uh, the bad guy squirted on us. Um, well, while we were in that area, we got ambushed. A real no shit lineal style ambush as we were leaving one of the dams one night to go back to wherever we were camping and uh, or resting overnight type of thing. And um, we were getting chewed up pretty good. The Afghanis in, in front of us were taking the brunt of the fire. Uh, you know, my truck got hit a couple of times. We bailed out and did basically a reactive contact. So that was actually the first time that I had that whole, you know, pucker factor where I was like, oh, shit, you know, we're behind the curve. And surviving that fight, and all of us Americans did survive that fight, um, really helped tune me up. It was like, okay, well, now I know how that feels. The reality is if you get attacked, you need to turn it into a defense. You need to turn that defense into an offense in three to five seconds, right? You get attacked, you better be able to assess it and flip it in three to five seconds, right? And whether that's break contact, or you know, charge into the ambush. We did some of both. Um, I kind of got it out of uh, that, that whole freaking the fuck out. <laughs> Excuse my language, right? No, go ahead, curse. You could fire yeah, it up. We got it out of our, our systems really early. So by the next time things were happening, and, and, and I've heard guys say different things, that it takes at least 10 gunfights to get used to them. And it could take 15, 20, or 30 gunfights uh, to get comfortable with them. And I, I mostly agree with that. There are some dudes out there who, you know, are super studs that are not affected whatsoever, <laughs> you know, and then there are dudes that, you know, they, they get through a gunfight and they realize they've pissed themselves, even though they did great. And then there are guys who, you know, that's their last gunfight and they get out. Right. So there's all those different types. Well, here's the reality, man. How many gunfights does the average law enforcement officer or American civilian, you know, those two groups of folks, how many gunfights do they get in in their career? Might be one maybe. for maybe, right? Many, how many officers retire without a single gunfight? Right. Well, the reality is in, in special operations, especially the white side, guys would get in like, you know, a, a fight and, you know, machine gun fire and it wasn't that close. It wasn't a direct action. It was while they were on a patrol. Um, so, you know, there's different scales of gunfights, right? If you're exchanging fire with a couple of dudes on a hillside in Afghanistan at 800 meters from the relative safety of an armored truck, you know, that type of gunfight doesn't necessarily screw with dudes, uh, affect them like a close encounter would with a police officer on the side of the road, you know, where it's license and registration, please. The next thing you get is gunfire, you know, um, or it starts out as a fight and, you know, maybe the perp gets the officer's firearm, right? That kind of stuff. That's so close and personal that in the first part of my career, I didn't experience anything like that. So by the time I did transfer over and start working with the agency and was running around by myself in most cases, you know, or up to a four man team, uh, sometimes six you know, things got a little more close and personal. I've had to use my handgun in self-defense purely three times with a fourth kind of questionable. Um, dude shot at me and then I had to chase him down a little bit, you know, so I don't really consider that one. And I, and I talk to folks, I will, I will tell guys, you know, I don't do the whole war story thing in my class classes but i will talk about these four incidences especially in pistol classes because they are purely self-defense one of them was in a hotel room with a couple of dirt bags and i barely survived it was you know seven years into the war i had quite a few experiences with come fights at that point but nothing nothing where i was behind the curve the entire time and i actually thought i was lucky not a lot of skill involved um, to have survived it. So, you know, it was at that point, I was like, holy shit. Um, and then it, luckily that prepared me for the next one that was not as bad. Um, and the, the third one that was, and, and I don't know if the, the second and third one were not as bad just because I had experienced the, the first one. So it, you know, it comes down to if you aren't, in a place, in a unit, or in a, an agency where you're going to get in a bunch of gunfights, 
you know, the, the only replacement is realistic training. And I think that's one of the things that sucks, whether it's in, in law enforcement or even special operations, uh, especially the white side. When I say white side for the audience, I'm talking like, you know, um, you're not Delta, not dev group, not not some of the special mission units out there, because those units have very few people and lots of money. So those guys tend to get far better training, lots of force on force. Um, they can hire role players or punching bags where they can actually go sims and go hands on. Whereas, you know, a lot of your white saw, you know, still think that live fire training is the best. Well, if you're using real bullets in the shoot house, you don't get to use role players. And it's actually quite opposite. You need to do both. But, you know, you got to put hands on. And I think you guys are seeing that a lot in law enforcement. Right. You know, in, in, a, in an academy these days. How many new recruits have been in a fist fight? Not many, but I will say this. I think that because the world has changed over the past 20 years with mixed martial arts, you probably get a few more guys who yeah. are uh, who are a little more comfortable fighting. But I got to tell you, I tell stories about how I went to the academy. I, th- I went to three of them. Uh, the third one I went to, oh, the, the defensive tactics was was a, it was, was a fucking joke. But uh, we had to box. And believe me, I am not some golden gloves boxer by any stretch of the imagination. Right. And then, and we're like, this is what they're giving us gloves. And we look ridiculous. They had the way they had his dress. And I mean, I'm watching adult men in their twenties getting swung at and falling to the ground before the thing even hits to try to find cover. And I remember somebody saying to me in the Academy, I'll never forget this my whole life. One of my classmates said, yeah, you and the other guy, uh, you guys are, you guys are good fighters. And I went, I thought I did terrible. Right. Like, and he's like, yeah, you guys are like, everybody's talking about it. you guys are like, you guys can really box. And I'm like, Re- really? Because I'm not a bo- like, <laughs> right. I, this is what you thought was good. I'm like, fuck, yeah. dude. Like I because I can throw some punches. Got a couple brothers. You know what I mean? Like we had brothers. My father used to spar with us. Right. We goof off. We beat the fuck out of each other. And that was actually really good training for me. Now I have three boys and I let them fucking kill each other nonstop. Yeah. Even, the, even yeah. now I got a fourth one's a girl. And she will fucking go dirty. She's a biter. She'll claw your face out. She's three. She'll fuck you up. Dude, I'm 46 male. And at this point, I'm going to claw and bite and all that shit, too, just because I'm getting older. (laughs) You know? Yeah, you know, I see it even in SF, man. You know, uh, until they get to the groups, the you know, and we're seeing a pullback. Uh, Greg Thompson created SOCOM, Special Operations Combatives Program. First time, first program of martial arts type stuff. I ever saw that I was like, okay, this works because Greg was a fighter uh, and he put it all together on like, Hey, stay on your feet. Uh, You can treat the walls like a cage. Uh, It's a good program, but we're seeing that get pulled back because dudes do get hurt in those classes, right? Guys are getting broken fingers, broken noses, that kind of stuff. I mean, they're padding up in fours and hitting each other with them. So it's, it's going to hurt. And, you know, but even still, man, you know, we got guys coming in who, like you said, they're either, some MMA badass that you don't want to scrap with in the first place, or they've never put their hands on another human being in their life uh, in in regards to something violent, whether it was even wrestling, you know, much less a street fight. Like me and the neighborhood boys, man, we fought and and like our parents didn't care. Right. You know, it was like, Oh yeah, well, whatever. Is anyone hurt? No. And the next day we were back, you know, riding four wheelers together and doing other redneck shit. Yeah. It's North Carolina. Yeah. 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 North Carolina. Um, you know, same dudes I would fist fight with, the same dudes I went hunting with, and the same dudes, that, you know, uh, we shot each other with BB guns and shit, you know? I do. Uh, you're li- literally talking about my fucking childhood. Right. Like everything you're talking about. I remember one kid's parents told me couldn't play tackle football. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't know. And, and, you know, how do, how do we change that? You know, I, I don't, I personally subscribe to the idea that, you know, a little bit of fist fighting here and there is not a bad thing. You know, the best fights I've ever gotten in were with teammates. And when I say best, we kicked the shit out of each other. My nose is all crooked from, you know, a warrant officer breaking my nose. Wow. uh, Because I was talking shit. You know, I was a young, dumb, talking. I was outside my lane, and I didn't realize how you got put back in your lane, right? So you're talking, you know, late 90s. In today's army, if a warrant officer broke a staff sergeant's nose, his career would be over. Mm -hmm. Over. He would be done. He'd get a Gomar, a general letter of reprimand. His career would be over and done. Not back then. Hell, company sergeant major made fun of me. 
He's like, maybe don't mess with those old dudes, bro. They're still here for a reason, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Back then, you know, warrant officers were late 30s, early 40s, um, you know, and they were they were the old dudes, you know. You didn't want to mess with those guys, as I found out. Um, I see it, you know, whether it's in the military. I mean, let's face it. America has a leadership crisis, whether – and, and the, the stakes are so much less in corporate America, right? I mean, if you have a corporation, a company – with horrible leadership, it goes out of business. People need to find jobs. But if you're chief or your supervisor or our team sergeant or my company commander, if they're weak and with you guys, right? If you're, you, you have weak, weak leadership. Oof, then do we are very high, right? We're, we're going to get people hurt. And it's weird because when leaders are put in those positions, they think their risk management somehow will keep people from getting hurt. But if you are worried about your officers or your you know, soldiers, your troopers, if your concern is they are going to get hurt in training, in a little bit of hand to hand, you're worried about a broken pinky or a broken nose um, or even maybe a chipped tooth, right? Hey, man, put the gear on. Yeah, let's not bare knuckle each other. You know, a little bit of padded gloves, mouthpieces or headgear, right? And let's get hands on. So the first time, that 120 pound female officer gets a fist fight. It's not on the side of the fucking highway. Right. You know, we just had a, um, an, an incident where a female deputy was shot here in Sampson County. Sampson County is down seven or eight deputies, right? They don't have the money. And it's one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. It's a huge County with very few people in it. They're struggling. So like a very good friend of mine's a supervisor. I mean, he's worked like the last three and a half weeks with one day off because he won't ask his people to work. He's a good, he, he'd make a great sheriff, I think. He, he just wants to retire. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, they were, this female officer was chasing fella. Of course, ended in the ditch. And as she rounded the corner and got there, it looked like the assailant per. I try to use y'all's terminology. If I'm using it wrong, forgive me, fellas. Well, uh, somebody uh, who shot at a cop, we're going to call him a piece of shit. Well, there you go, right? Yeah. So, ends in the ditch, but by the time she gets there, the door's open, and there's this gentleman walking up down the side of the road. Identifies himself, basically says, you know, he's the neighbor, and he heard the crash. No, man, it was the driver. She takes him at his word. He's like, yeah, I think he ran off in the woods. And her uh, patrol partner pulls up and she's like, yeah, um, you know, this gentleman says that he ran in the woods, blah, blah, blah. And for some reason, I don't know why. And, and again, I don't know the full details. So if I speak incorrectly, huge apologies of both of these officers. But I got this from another deputy. Long story short, the male deputy who arose second went into the woods to look around for him. Like, because typically he was thinking he might, he might just be hiding a few feet in the woods, right? A lot of times they don't run that far, I guess. Well, the driver, who the officer still think is just the next door neighbor, says, hey, I'm going to go to my house and get a flashlight and my ID for you. And she says, okay. So he walks off, man. He was free and clear. He could have just kept right on walking. But for whatever reason, he came back and immediately went to put in putting it on her um and the way i understand this and again if the details are, are wrong huge apology but the way i understand it she panicked a bit he was trying to get her gun she takes her gun and tosses it in a panic right like it, i guess her thought process was if i could get my gun away from me and him you know maybe i can get my taser maybe i don't i don't know exactly but long story short he breaks contact with her and gets her pistol shoots at her nine times point blank and hits her in the ankle <laughs> so she got lucky right lucky 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 right she's checking the lucky box over and over again her partner hears the gunshots obviously and comes running out this dude runs off he's gone and it was the first time she'd ever done any any fighting in her life mm-hmm Right. You know, she wasn't prepared for it. And a lot of guys, you know, a lot of people who are not police officers who haven't been in violent confrontations or aren't putting their lives at risk will say, you know what? She she shouldn't been on the job in the first place. She's not big enough. She's not whatever. Hey, man, the reality is in America today, 
females, no matter if they're 100 pounds or 180 pound badass MMA fighter, right? A heavy, you know, Ronda Rousey could be a police officer, right? That's the world we live in. I don't, I don't even care if we agree with that, you know, whether or not they should be or not. There are women that I know in this profession that I would take over some of the fucking men that I know in this profession. I'm going to say that right now. Uh, you know, and again, I'm not saying it's both sides of the coin. Uh, there just happens to be a, a far less percentage of women who do police work. Uh, I want to say, and don't quote me, it's 90 to 10, right? So it's 90% male, 10% yeah, sure. female. Um, but I've seen some of these girls that I've worked with and uh, seen in the field who were just straight up badasses. And I want to go into this. I yeah. Every time I show videos in my class and I have to do this in training, I have to Monday morning quarterback. And I always tell people, it's not with the intention of trying to make myself feel better because I'm insecure. I'm yeah. showing you where they went wrong. Right. This is what happened. I always tell people in class, if you want to do yourself a favor, go home and watch uh, three hours of police officers killed in the line of duty. And this is a weird thing to say, but I can't bring them back. What we can do is figure out what went wrong. Absolutely. And so you're aware of what that happened, what occurred there. So people come to us and they say, hey, you know, you want to talk on this? Like, you know, puts us in a rough spot because we know that that's somebody that they care about, that a lot of people care about. It really affected the community at some level and uh, or tremendous level. And then we also are like, but if we don't say this to other guys and girls in this profession, we're doing a disservice. So we're between this fucking rock and a hard place times. Um, and I specifically take live PD videos and I just warn people, hey, if you're watching live PD, watch it with extreme discretion. You should be watching it going, what are they doing? Because every time you watch it, you go, what are they doing? Well, you know, it all comes down to a lack of training. After action review. The after action review, you know, my team, I was raised, you know, that the after action review, you know, there are no feelings and emotions allowed in the after action review. And so I am used to an AAR type concept where I can watch something. You can see that, that, that turning point, right? You can usually find that one moment, the one thing where, or where the situation has changed, where the perp, the piece of shit freaking makes that decision, right? Okay, I, they've assessed the officer. They think they can win and get away. And, and that type of scenario is kind of scary because, you know, if, if in that first few minutes when you're interviewing someone, right? And like I said, I think a lot of times a lot of guys see me, they, they think that I was just like an ODA member, right? So a lot of times, man, when I was out there, you know, as the, the, the lone operator, the singleton, whatever, you know, you're interacting with someone you know, that I may very well attempt to detain by myself. So it's close to what you guys do. It's similar. Again, it's not the same. And I, I'm straight up about that. But I can watch a traffic stop gone bad. I can watch these things and assess them. And you know what? I mean, I think sometimes it's beneficial to law enforcement to have guys like us, you know, or other people assess, you know, and do an after action review because we have a different perspective. Um, and then it's take it or leave it. No emotions. Right. And, and, and the reality is, you know, I think because I get this sometimes if I post something that's even slightly scrutinizing of something a law enforcement officer did nine times out of 10, there's going to be some law dog that comes into the comments like, well, you don't know what it's like. And I'm like, you're right. But I can look at that video and see where that officer made a mistake. I can see that. You know, they bumbled their reloads and that could have been rectified with a little bit more training or, or whatever, you know, uh, in the intent to saving the next officer's life, right? With the intent of saving the next person's life, whatever it is, you know, and I mean, let's face it, I would like for every law dog to spend their entire career and never have to shoot someone, Right. I mean, we see shooting and hurting other Americans, other people, especially you guys, other Americans, right? Even if he's a felony, you know, piece of shit, it's still an American. So I can only, I can't, I can't relate to that, right? Because I, my adversaries have always been, you know, enemies of our country. Where you guys, man, you're dealing with other Americans. And, and like, I would, I wish that none of you ever had to pull your guns and shoot someone because it can ruin ruin a life ruin the mental state of an officer um we see it even in like home defense situations where the um the the homeowner defending their family still has to deal with the ptsd or whatever you want to call it when they shoot someone 
right? Like we have natural inhibitions, like all animals, right? Um, two male lions get in a fight over the pride. They don't kill each other. Two elks, right? It's freaking the rut right now. And uh, so we're watching all these elk videos, right? Where these big monsters are just fighting and one of them submits, right? Human beings have those same inhibitions, but then we develop tools that allowed us to hurt people at further distances, right? Whether it was a, a stick and a rock, and then we progressed to what? Uh, spears. And then we progressed to, you know, uh, oh, bow and yeah. arrow, yep. archery, and then the long bow. We got really good at like basically artillery, you know, where that archer is lobbing arrows into a compound with zero interaction with, with his target, right? So we have those same inhibitions. So it, it, it's human beings can be breakable, right? We're breakable mentally. Um, and so I also think that training helps offset that. And again, let's face it, your super ninja units are out there training nonstop to interact with other people. Police officers, you're going to get a couple of times a year, you know, in service training. And, and, and let me throw that in that like it's also probably some of the worst training that's offered them. Typically the free stuff, typically, not all of it. Sometimes it's grant money that's hires a guy like you and comes into some good shit. But typically like in service, oh, it's they pick somebody at the fucking agency Right. Usually it's some administrator who's just like, yeah, you do it, Pete. Like, whatever. What do you want me to do? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Fucking tell them how to do CPR. Well, I've never done CPR for real. I'm not an EMT. Yeah, we got nobody else. So they bring it. it it's it's really right. just very disheartening. And, you um, you know, we know we know that we've collected this group of people at this training company now, 40 plus instructors that I have now for 10 years sifted through all this crap to find these really, really special people to give the kind of training that cops deserve. There's no way you can duplicate almost anybody at this training profession, at this training company, because they're so unique. They're that, they're that Michael Jordan of their arena. These are the guys and girls who really know right. this shit. Well, and you know, anyway, from de-escalation to case law, to medical tactics, you know, we got a guy, a medical tactical guy is a uh, flu 75, uh, combat missions in Afghanistan in support of special forces. Right. He's a, he's a paramedic instructor in Oklahoma city literally has dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of IED victims and gunshot victims, especially overseas with seven, six, two and all this crazy shit. Right. And then you got who's training TCC at, at a, at a, at a place, some fucking dude who's been in patrol for four years, uh, hasn't made more than seven traffic stops. Only the arrests he's had are the ones that, and he right. works in Podunk, middle of fucking nowhere. And this is your TCC trainer. So well, you can't and, duplicate what Sean Barnett can do. And it goes right, right back to that leadership failure of the budget. And, and you know, I, I talk to my buddies and, and you know, I, I look in their brand new charger or their brand new, um, you know, Dodge Durango. And they've got the nicest computers and these fancy or whatever, you know. I know Wilmington PD has horses and bikes. And from my perspective, I'm like, what does a department need to maintain a stable full of horses for? That sounds like a lot of waste of money and motorcycles, right? Like, I don't really understand exactly what a I know. I understand passion projects. Some of these, are, listen, this, some of these things yeah. are passion projects, right? You get a guy yeah. goes to the top and he likes motorcycles. So they get motorcycles or get a guy to go to the top. I mean, listen, I watched it. The misappropriation of funds. It's yeah. absurd. Um, and I would think about you could take four hundred thousand dollars in a training budget being used for uh, in a budget using for something that we really don't need and yeah. disseminate that to the 50, 60 guys in the patrol division and get them ten thousand dollars worth of training a piece or eight thousand dollars worth of training a piece. And let, let's face it, eight thousand dollars worth of training for an individual. Man, that's that's pretty amazing. That's more than what your average freaking soft guy individually is going to get um, for his individual skills. Yeah, you know, it just kind of blows my mind where the money is spent because, you know, like motorcycles, when I see a cop on a motorcycle, I'm like, how vulnerable is that guy? You Wait, check I mean? this out. How about this? You're going to like this one. What they do is also they take the training budgets and who goes to training? Command staff doesn't go on the road anymore. Where's uh, where's Captain so-and-so? Oh, he's a tactical shooting school today. He's yeah. 38 years on the job. He's been inside for 14. He has a take home unmarked. He doesn't even wear a uniform anymore. And he's a tactical rifle school. And you got 18 in guys in patrol who get qualified once a yeah. quarter with, a, with an yeah. AR. And you shoot 20 rounds at a target. And not yeah. only a target, 
a reduced Q because we don't have hundred yard ranges for the qualifications, yeah. right? Yeah. It's 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 what dude, it's wild. And it's you, selfish. It's like fucking yeah. selfish. AR qual. Holy crap. ARs are, are pretty easy to shoot. <laughs> you know? I yeah, it's frustrating. It must be, you know, it's frustrating for me, my perspective, just because I want you guys to have the, all the tools. And for me, it's a selfish reason. Because when you have confident officers, just like if you have confident operators, whatever you want to call them, right? Soldiers, troopers. Uh, if, if they're confident in their abilities and their capabilities and the, the, the equipment they're carrying, if they're confident in their abilities to operate that equipment, whether it's a pistol or a taser or whatever, the extreme uses of force or the negligent uses of force will go down. The most confident officers out there will de-escalate, know how to de-escalate. The, just out of the way they carry and present themselves, they're going to get respect from that predator perpetrator, that that you know that guy they pulled over who's, I ain't going back, you know, mm-hmm. that felon. He's like, I ain't going back. They get a different response than that clearly not confident officer, mm-hmm. right? I've seen it, you know, with, with us on our side too, man. Due to just have that presence of confidence you know there's you know two grown men man they they can sense that confidence you know uh, i know you know what i'm talking about right freaking you know officers whether it's yourself or rich or whoever right guys that are you know when they pull a car over that person in that car knows darn well they're calm cool collected but will also whoop your ex <laughs> you know they can and, tell they can what? tell. I had people say it to me. Yeah. You know, hey, I was thinking about running. Well, why didn't you run? I was scared of you. I thought if you caught me, I would kick your fuck. You would kick my ass. Or I'd get compliments back. At, I knew when I got pulled. I, I, heard, I heard this one a lot. I knew when I got pulled over that I was going to jail today. I go, what'd you think that? Well, just the way you handle yourself, dude. You're very street smart. I noticed that right away. You're like, I, I got guys. I'm like, yeah, you're fucking hood, bro. Like, <laughs> motherfuckers, yeah. no. A yeah. dude like you, you might be a fucking... One of these guys from the suburbs, but you're hood, dude. Like, you know shit. You're sh- I've had, how you get compliments, bro. Right. My hat's off to you. I don't know how the fuck you caught us. Yeah. Right. Well, let's face it, right? Your average gangster, you know, he, he didn't really want to get shot, right? He's not a suicide bomber. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, and, and even like with us overseas, man, you know, dudes would throw their hands up in a second. They, they, they were committed to their jihad when they were able to shoot at us as we drove by. But when we hit the brakes, you know what I mean? And they're like, oh, shit, freaking these dudes aren't just going to run like whatever supply convoy we hit last week. Like these are the oh, shit, they've got beards. <laughs> you know what I mean? They they act different. They know. And, and that's what confidence provides the officer on the street. And, and how do we get confidence without true experience right like really that that violent those shootouts right well that it's training the answer is simple it's, it is training and it's realistic training which means force on force not you know i think too often i hear it all the time you know, cops can't shoot well okay um and yet somehow right like because you'll you'll see it you know sf guys can't shoot you know or whatever you know no the average police officer, the average special forces dude, the average ranger, SEAL, white side saw, they're not that great as shooters. They have a lot of other things to do, right? They're not going to be able to go and, you know, beat pro shooters. They have a lot of other jobs that they have to train for, a lot of other things, uh, skills they have to maintain, right? And the reality is I actually hold less live fire, especially on the flat range, because how is it police officers and SF dudes and SEALs survive close contacts with their pistols if they're not that good shooter? Because the reality is at five meters and in, it takes very little skill. Mm-hmm. Very little. It's not even the shooting part because that's just lining up a couple of posts and pressing a button, right? That is not hard. It's don't fumble with that triple, you know, retention holster you guys are <laughs> required to wear, right? I used to joke, you know, because before the military started running like the ALS holsters and stuff, we were running like latex, you know, open top tension, re- you know, type holsters, you know, as more and more of the triple retention safari lands started coming into my classes, I used to make fun. It's like, Hey man, do you have to 
call the president to get permission to skin that pistol or what? Like how many buttons are on that thing? Like, where's your retina scanner? <laughs> and so to me, it's all about just getting your gun out and then being able to defend it, right? Because we keep seeing videos of either, you know, an officer having their gun taken away. Um, you know, we've done a lot of retention type training and it's not difficult. It's really not difficult, right? Like I always talk about people, you know, uh, how you carry your gun in CQB. Well, I carry my pistol mostly presented in a pretty relaxed, just over the sights, it's out here. Well, because the reality is it's still shorter than my carbine. I'm not worried about someone taking my gun, you know, because I always ask people in my classes, I'm like, okay, so when we're talking about retention, what type of person tries to take another person's gun? I get all kinds of answers and it's, you know, a crazy person, a bad person, uh, you know, whatever. And I ask them, I'm like, okay, wait, wait, stop. You are looking at my question from your perspective. You're a good guy. All right. Now, what if you get mugged by a dude with a gun and you don't have one? What are you going to do? And they're like, well, we're going to try and take it. I was like, so what type of person tries to take another man's gun? And they're like, oh, someone who doesn't have one. So I don't base my techniques and tactics around that person, because if I've got a gun, I clearly have the advantage. And, you know, throughout my entire career with just a little bit of retentive type training, I've been able to defend my gun and I've never had my gun taken except for by one person. When you're doing some uh, combatives, retention training, and the gentleman, his last name was, um, you may have heard of this family. His last name was Gracie. <laughs> And it was one of those drills where, you know, you sit back to back with your feet extended and the gun's like six foot away, ready, go. And so I had a choice, go for the gun and give up my back, clearly a losing proposition, or turn around and try to fight this guy and still lose, right? There was, there was no, no way I was winning this, right? So I went for the gun, hoping I might get lucky. When I woke up, the Mr. Gracie was handing me my pistol you know, and laughing. And I said, okay, cool. And I was like, and this is all well and good. We're fighting over a gun. I was like, but now we're four foot apart and I have a gun. You want to start from here? Cause it's more realistic. I was mm -hmm. like, screw it. I'll even put it in my pants and at four feet, I don't care how badass you are. And he is clearly a badass. You're not taking my gun. Mm -hmm. right? So anyway, my point to all of that is, is a little tiny bit of re retention weapons, retention training goes so far and i have no doubt in my mind had that deputy had some of that training she would have been able to defend herself with that pistol with confidence and not panicked and gone to some really extreme thing and like i said it's so easy to armchair quarterback and just be like you know what she should have never been a cop and she should be fired and blah blah and i'm like yeah but she didn't get the training she needed whose fault is that right correct of course you know clearly my, my complete position, I always talk about this. You were talking before about leadership. It's interesting because uh, we're recording this as October 5th, 2022. And there's two things that are trending on social media. The first one is a sheriff somewhere who has now adamantly stated that his police officers are no longer going to be stopping cars for minor, quote unquote, in his mind, moving violations or minor traffic violations. Now they're going to focus on strictly very, very fast cars. So basically what they're doing is that and they're saying that there has been um, racial disparities in the way the cops are performing in his county. Now, if that's true and you're a leader, what you're saying to the public is, OK, uh, we're going to now give a pass to the bad guys. All criminals now get a pass. I'm going to handcuff my cops instead of training them. If you're saying that they're racist, quote unquote, why would we just take training? It's got a hard time believing that cops in 2022 are inherently racist. I think it's probably untrained. I don't think they go out with the intention of going, you know what? Let's go get all these different kinds of people who are well, we're going to target. I just I can't hear it. I teach nationally and it comes down to a matter of training, not sensitivity training, maybe some of that. But like, hey, I know what you guys are trying to do. Uh, you might think it looks like this, but it actually looks more like this. And you can do it this way and da da da. And we have to consider these things instead of, nope, that's it. You're a criminal in this county. Don't worry. The sheriff's department's not going to bother you. Now, right. on the other side of things. Well, and he's also basically admitting that he, as a leader, has somehow allowed racism to 
you know, flourish or at least exist at some exactly. level yeah. is department. Yeah. Like, he has if a- you think that exists, you should go officer to officer or deputy to deputy. And if you see that trend in that deputy, fire them. That's or at least the- find out what, what happened and maybe offer some retraining or some sensitivity, whatever it may be. Right. Now, on the other hand, we have Grady Judd, who today, unfortunately, yesterday, a very young sheriff's deputy, uh, I think his name is Blaine Lane, was killed in the line of duty. And it was friendly fire. And it was very, very unfortunate. And I'm not going to certainly challenge a the training there. What I'm saying is when the press showed up, uh, Grady Judd, they said, why were police officers serving a warrant at three o'clock in the morning? And boy, he said, if you don't think we serve warrants at three o'clock in the morning, you're just plain stupid. And you have no business talking to me about what the cops do. And you know, he really went on this tirade. And this is not the first time Grady Judd has shown his spine and his set of fucking cojones. Now, you have people, if we look at the realm of things, we're in a, we're in a time in society where cops don't want to do this job anymore. Yeah. But, and, and there's a lot of retention issues. You just said your, your, your county's down seven, eight guys and girls. But it's yeah, interesting I've, because Grady Judd, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Grady Judd doesn't pay much in that county. I know they don't make a ton of money compared to maybe South Florida doing, you know, six figure salaries. But yet, him, Wayne Ivey, and a few other, Mark Lamb, they don't have the highest paid sheriff's departments, but they're a list of people who want to work for those men for even 20, 30, 40,000 less, which is 20, 30, yeah. 40% less, uh, is endless for the most part. They don't have any <laughs> issues with retention because they trust their leader. Now, this guy in North Carolina who probably is already up against a tough situation where he can't pay people appropriately because nobody in North Carolina makes a lot of money as a cop. Uh, now, people are going to be like, Yo, let's get the fuck out of here. And the crazy thing is the next county over probably has open arms and says, you yeah, know, no, come to us. If you're good, now we'll get you. Yeah. Who loses in this whole thing? The people that you were elected to serve on yeah. bad calls. That was a bad yeah. call. I will invite that gentleman on this podcast and he will never accept in a million fucking years because the truth hurts. Let's have a conversation about the truth. Let's lay it all out there. You're a cop. I'm a cop or I was a cop. You were a cop, whatever it may be. And let's talk about it. So when you talk about leadership and a leadership problem, we see it everywhere. And I get it right. Like right now, as we you know, were talking when we first first linked up was, you know, there it's no longer like when it was in the early 90s when, you know, it was you know, you, you gangster rap, you know, fuck the police and all those, you know, um, ice teas and ice cubes and all that uh, who all turned out to play cops on TV, um, ironically. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a lot of hate and animosity coming towards police officers out of inner cities and that sort of thing. Um, but nowadays, it's that has spread. And, you know, I think law enforcement, especially chief law enforcement officers, have to take it into account. But it's not appeasement. It's better training for your officers that will solve this. Right. You correct. know, if lack of confidence goes beyond the individual officer. And now the people that elected that sheriff, that elected the city council, that hired the chief, the people, we the people start seeing um, taser, 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 pow. Oops. Those videos. And, and let's face it, right? Like, I keep seeing some via videos from law enforcement officers and I'm like, you guys know you're being filmed, right? Like in this day and age, you can't freaking get a cup of coffee in the convenience store without there being a camera somewhere right so for us it was kind of similar right we used to joke like when are the seals going to stop wearing fucking helmet cams right it was a joke right but it wasn't a joke the reality is commanders leadership for for accountability and liability purposes more and more things and more and more officers are going to have cameras attached to them but even if you're somehow in a place as a law enforcement officer, that you're not required to wear a body cam at this point. There are cameras everywhere. So sometimes I'm like, what were y'all thinking? Mm-hmm. You know, there was just, I think it was Arkansas, maybe state troopers. I don't know. There was a video where they were kind of behind like this little corner of a building. And this dude was just letting this fella have it. I'm talking. I was like, ooh, ooh. I don't know the context, but I don't care what the context is. That guy that they have on the ground, three officers, even if he shot at them or shot at a pregnant woman before this was caught on camera, man, an officer punching this dude repeatedly in the head when two other officers are on top of him, 
right? Like, how are you going to defend that? Like, come on, guys, you're on camera. So now that you know this, right, stop pushing the limits. You know, stop doing the things that you know is going to get. And if that means, I mean, I hate to say this, but I mean, I have officer buddies who are like, you know what? I, I don't even press for felonies anymore because they're just going to get, you know, juked, right? Like Wilmington, North Carolina is bad, right? It is a college town with a beach problem, UNCW. It is 60 some percent female, right? Riceful beach, beautiful beach. One of the nicest places in, you know, beaches in North Carolina. You're not getting a felony assault freaking convicted. It's not happening. The DA is not going to allow those, those stats to appear on Wilmington's freaking whatever, ledgers, rosters. So like I got officer buddies who are like, God, I'm not even doing it. I'm not getting put in that position. He's like, why would I even risk my life? Or why would I risk losing my job when I know darn well that felon that I'm about to stop is going to want to fight me. I'm going to have to whoop his ass. And then it's going to be on camera and I'm going to lose my job. So I'm not even making that stop. And again, it goes back to poor administrations. It goes back yeah. to poor administrations because if, if the precedent was, even from the political administrations, um, that, listen, with crimes, I mean, New York's out of control right now. Uh, the new, you know, I, I'm not going to start with that, but I want to talk about a few things yeah. uh, to just play devil's advocate in some of the things that you've said. Yeah. You know, that concern of always being on camera can be a double edged sword because I think what yeah. guys are and girls are also recognizing is that, oh, that looked bad. If I have to use force, it'll also look bad. But the reality is, is you have to understand the difference between excessive force and achieving your objective. And sometimes Absolutely. objective achieving looks excessive. Absolutely. So if you're fighting me as a cop and I'm losing, we're getting dirty. I mean, we're getting, I'm going to eat your, I'm going to like literally claw your fucking, you're going to try to kill me. And, you know, I, I try to be like, you got to be prepared for this. Yeah. And, and I always tell people, look, unfortunately, sometimes the world isn't fair for law enforcement, but majority of people support you. And yes, the people who are, looking at you under this microscope are the people that don't support you. Now, it doesn't mean that these people who do support you, a far majority, 99% of people deserve an unenthusiastic cop to show up because then we have more victims. So you can't show up to a job unenthusiastic when every minute of the day you might get killed. That unenthusiasm will transfer into your ability to get murdered. Yeah, everything about what you guys are doing these days is a double-edged sword. And you're now dealing with double-edged sword in a very confined space, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, you know, it's a rock and a hard place for everything you guys are doing. And I, I feel for you. Uh, you know, I've, I've kicked around going to our b school and becoming a reserve officer just to help, you know, they're down this many people. I'm, while I am getting a little older, I'm still in pretty good physical condition. I could help cover, you know, just like, uh, you know, we had the hurricane over the, you know, uh, came in on uh, Thursday, Friday last week, you know, I texted the sheriff and said, Hey, sheriff, I know you guys are short staffed. So if you need any type of help down here in this side of the County, please don't hesitate to ask. And I, like I said, I kicked around, you know, becoming a, a sworn officer. I'm still toiling. My biggest setback is it's a six month school. Uh, the night classes, I think it's four months. And guess what you're the best part is tone. You're going to learn nothing. That's the coolest thing. <laughs> well, you're going to abs- swing a stick at a bag and scream, get back. Yeah. It's, and, it's and ridiculous. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out. I may do it. I don't know. I haven't even really talked to Sheriff about it. I've talked to some of the chief deputies and my buds and stuff. And they're like, we'd love to have you. You know, uh, you know, I could at least help with some training or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, man. It's just, it is a huge time commitment. Um, so I don't it know. Is. Point being is, you know, I hate it for y'all. I fucking hate it. I want good officers. I want a lot that. of people do. A lot of people do. A lot of people hate it. Yeah, you know, and and at the same time, it's like if the requirements, right, if BLET, if I could challenge the course or something like that, right, I would offer my time to the sheriff's department for free. You know what I mean? I'd work three or four nights a month for free Mm -hmm. just to help back the dudes up, Um, even if it was just serving the you know higher risk warrants or, or hell, I don't care. Even if it was just riding around in a patrol car in the late night, I would help. Um, but again, the barrier to entry for, for me is, is kind of like, is it time, uh, money, you know, I mean, I still have to like pay my bills, right? but and so that's a little frustrating. And while I want to help, it's like, okay, I know that with the scholarship for the courses, I can at least help there. That's easy. 
right? That's an easy, easy uh, fix. But man, it is, man, watching you guys and talking to you guys is so frustrating. And then again, when I see what looks like excessive force, even to me, somebody who, you know, I, frankly, I'm, I'm okay with a little bit of violence. <laughs> you know, I'm okay with handing out an ass whipping or even taking one. But when I do see the stuff, you know, like the gun instead of the taser and the, uh, you know, some of the stuff that looks like a little excessive, right? And again, there's always more to the story, always. And, and, right. and as a person who I have had 15, six investigations, right? Well, and that that's an internal review of, um, you know, shootings and stuff like that with the military. Uh, I had one um, with the agency that, you know, was a big deal. And so I know what it's like to be under that microscope. So I don't take it lightly. And so I, I am very calculated when I do offer any type of after action review to any officers, whether it's, you know, face to face or with a crew or even on the internet with a video. You know, I want officers to do a good job and to be confident and to get the training they deserve or they need. They absolutely need, not deserve, need, right? Like it's a requirement that you guys aren't getting. And it is so frustrating, man, because it all goes back to, you know, man, I will always go back to the Ranger Handbook, right? The Ranger Handbook is that, you know, next to the actual Bible, right? The Ranger Handbook is the leadership infantryman's freaking rucksack, freaking ground pounders Bible. And right up, right up front, it says the leader is responsible for everything that does and does not happen. So if you have an officer who does something or a military member who does something and it is directly related to, related to a failure on the next line, whether it's the supervisor, whether it's the chief or, you know, some lieutenant in between, right? Can they be solely accountable? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. If the chief decided to buy motorcycles and maintain horses, instead of providing with the basic defensive tactics training that are needed, and let's face it, like you said, the average DT course is horrible. So if we're filling these these line officers, right, it's not their fault. I, I agree. This is the last time a chief was fired for a law enforcement, for, for an actual line officer doing something when they didn't have the appropriate training for the situation they were placed in. Doesn't happen. Never heard of it. When was the last time a sheriff resigned, you know, or, a, or was told to resign? You know, it doesn't happen. And, and it's the same in the military, man. You know, when was the last time you heard of a colonel being, you know, relieved of duty because of, you know, not providing the proper training that the troopers needed? It just doesn't right. happen. It's a crisis of leadership, bro. No, oh, there's no question about it. I have a few more, a few more questions for you. One, I just want to say a few things. Um, there was, there's certainly a lack of training, and that's what we see in all these videos. It just comes down to a lack of training. And, you know, Tony, I come down to one thing and one theory on why these people are not motivated to try, to train is... Because they don't think it's going to happen to them. They mm. just don't think it's going to happen to them. Now, statistically speaking, it may not. The right. statistics point that it might not happen. <laughs> it probably won't. Have you seen the video? Uh, it's a recent one. It's a, I'm sure you've seen it where the cop pulls up. It's an active shooter situation. He's drinking a cup of coffee, puts it on the dashboard, hops out very gingerly. Not, it doesn't seem like the guy has a nerve shivering in his body, grabs his AR, lines up his shot, and knocks it down like 186 yards or something like that. I saw that video. It was sent to me very early on, but I think before it went, hit the internet. And I immediately sent it to JT and Evan over at Black Rifle Coffee. I was like, you know, looks like a good ad to me, you know. Um, the dude really does, man. He pulls up, puts it in park, puts it on the dash. Cool as a cucumber. And my question, my serious question was, what is this dude's background? Right. Where does this come from? I mean, this is a, a dude that looks like he's had 200 gunfights plus under his uh, belt and 183 yards with a red dot on a mu moving aggressive human being. That's a pretty damn good shot. Yeah. You know, shots fired suspect down or whatever exactly. Said Dude, I mean, it's crazy because like, if you weren't known as the most badass motherfucker in the history of mo badass motherfuckers with a rifle, you had now have earned the crown for the time being. <laughs> it's the right. Yeah. I'm going to ask you this. I don't know if you can talk about this, but I think people have told me about this story, but the we're going way back to when about middle when we were doing this podcast is can you talk about the hotel room experience that changed your life? 
that would be fucking bad. I think people wanted to hear that. If you can, if you can't, respect. I'll summarize it. Um, a meeting, two bad guys. Um, firearm was off body. I was in a place where I was dressed nice, wearing a suit uh, to blend in. And um, dirtbag pulled a gun out on me, uh, sitting at a table across from him, a very small table. And uh, you know, everybody says, make space. Well, we're on the sixth floor, bro. <laughs> what was he going to do? Jump out the window? No, they got mm. shot. And I just kind of sat back and was like, Ooh, all right. Is this, is this how it's going to go down? Damn it. Like, this is not how I thought it was going to go. And my Glock is right there on the floor. It's right there. My bag is open. I can see it, but it's just out of reach. You know, I'd have to bend down to get it. And I was like, ah, well, dude pulls his gun back, stuffs it back in his pants, Pakistani made fake Beretta. You know, I'm like, please don't shoot me with that. <laughs> right. I, I do. If I'm going to be shot, at least, you know, use a, you know, a, a legitimate firearm, not some bullshit gun. Uh, so a lot is going through my head. I mean, that's literally the stuff that I'm thinking about. I'm like, damn it. You know, my buds are going to make fun of me after I'm dead. Cause this dude shoots me with a Pakistani made Beretta copy. <laughs> but anyway, he, he leans back and makes a joke and he stows his gun. And uh, I went, mm, all right, it's on right now. We're going to fight and went for my gun uh, we both kind of start to stand up first round. I pull out table hits my gun causes a malfunction. Oh, and I did hit him, uh, but not a lethal shot. And his bodyguard is now getting involved. His guns out and he's shooting at me. I've got the dude by his hair, like trying to put him between me and his bodyguard. And like, we go fall over it's wall heater, right? It's winter time. It's pretty cold outside fall up against this heater it burns the back of my head the back of my neck and uh all the while bodyguard dude's still trying to shoot me um long story short man i was able to clear the malfunction and deal with both threats and it's a pretty small hotel room man like nowhere near as like even big as like a daggone i don't know whatever little small rinky dink freaking old school 1970s motel room like your crack hotel room right it's it's small and um I'm standing in the corner now, just, <gasps> and at this point, man, like I said, I, this, that's, that was one of the ones I referenced earlier where I had already been in plenty of tussles, plenty of gunfights, but never one where no shit I thought I was losing. Like I was like, uh Oh, I'm, I'm not making it out of here. So I'm standing in the corner, just like trying to catch my breath. And I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm more shocked that I'm not leaking. Right. Because bodyguard piece of shit shot so close to my face that I, I felt the heat and the pressure from the gun. And I was just like, holy crap. The only reason he missed that I can think of is he was trying not to hit his balls. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Only reason he missed me. Cause I'm talking point blank. I mean, he could have hit me with his gun easier than he could have shot me. Well, I'm, like I said, man, I'm texting my buddy and I'm like, holy crap. Still just, I can't even believe I'm not leaking. That was my biggest takeaway. At no point, you know, I, I sometimes when I sit and listen to some of this like um, color coding, you know, where you lose auditory, vision gets blurred, all that stuff. I, I've never experienced that. And if there was one time that I probably should have, it would have been then, um, you know, outnumbered two to one behind the curve. I should have experienced all those things. Now, I can only think that the reason I didn't experience those things is that I did have enough experience at this point because we're, uh, duh, 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 we're seven years, like I said, seven years or so into the war at this point. And um, yeah, man, it, it was pretty amazing. I didn't, I was texting my buddy who was, you know, downstairs, uh, you know, with the car and I was just like, hey, bro, freaking, you know, we got a little incident, freaking, but I mean, I could still text and that was you know old, old <laughs> wait the best is little incident <laughs> yeah um and, and you know but like i said when you talk about incidents with people and how you know it's like i said to get accustomed to a fight to get accustomed to violence how many you know iterations or, or experiences does it take to get comfortable i don't know you know it's mm -hmm. like holy shit. and i know it varies man you know some dudes are just monsters you know ready to be violent when the day they came out of the looms other guys you know need to be you know stair stepped into it so i you know i always tell guys man the answer has to be training in the absence of 
being able to go find violence on a daily, like, you know, if you're in the Ranger Regiment or one of the SMUs or, you know, super cool ninja units, you know, for police officers, man, it's got to be training. It's got to be realistic training. And, you know, the first time you have to put your hands on somebody definitely shouldn't be in a traffic stop. You know, the first time you're practicing active shooter, active killer, freaking stuff, you know, shouldn't be in a live situation where you're not confident, where you have nothing to res- to fall back on, you know, um, what's that old saying about rising to occasions? No, you're going to default to your training or whatever. That's, it's absolutely true. Now, I think some of that, you know, we were talking about, you know, you mentioned that sometimes officers, you know, just don't think it's going to happen to them. And statistically, they're probably correct, right? But, you know, we use that, you know, that terminology, course of action right enemy has a most likely course of action and a most deadly or dangerous course of action well we better train the most to the most likely right we need to be most prepared for and most trained for the likely courses of action but you better have at least addressed the most deadly you know and i i i've talked to officers before about like hey if you walk up to a car and they automatically start shooting and they miss, that's easy, right? Like, that's easy. That's pull your gun out and return fire, which is pretty easy. But it's when you try to put them in cuffs that they start fighting, and they're bigger and stronger and more aggressive. They're not going back. They're going to get ready to take your gun. Man, that's the stuff that can be trained in the do- in the dojo, mm-hmm. you know? And, and you're talking once a week. You know, an hour a day, instead of doing cardio, if you're a gym rat, and that's a whole different story with officers. How about instead of watching Netflix? Absolutely. You know? Let yeah, me get, you, get your ass up and go fucking learn how to fight. Some departments will even give, you know, guys an hour for the gym. Uh, I know Wilmington PD at least used to. And uh, so I had a gym in Wilmington. I used to own a gym in Wilmington. And officers would come in at the beginning of their shift or the end of their shift or their lunch break and knock out a quick workout. You know, I don't know if that's the trend in, in departments or not, but even still, you're talking about an hour of rolling or fighting or striking, you know, and, and I don't know a single, all the different dojos I know are very cop friendly, you know, the, the black belts will roll with you, mm-hmm. you know, it just, it's confidence. And where does confidence come from experience and training? It's awesome. Well, it's a great note to finish on Tony yeah. Cowden. Where can they find you? Yeah. Um, so on Insta, you know, Tony underscore Cowden underscore. Uh, and then, of course, Capable underscore Inc. There for a while when I was running for office, right, my personal page became a little political. I'm starting to kind of segue out of that, starting to post a little more uh, shooting and that sort of stuff there. But, you know, Capable is uh, fitness and shooting stuff all the time. And then, of course, the website is CapableIncorporated.com. The whole word spelled out, right? We've got the longest URL out there i believe <laughs> well dude i can't wait till we get to fucking hang out in person one day absolutely i you know um i had a class up there with rich that we had to reschedule and we've not rescheduled it yet um so this is a reminder that i'll hit up rich get that class rescheduled and we'll train together then i'll come down bro I just, dude i got a stag 10 i haven't shot yet yeah hey man i tell you you want to come down here if you're willing to make the drive to north carolina man we will make time to hang out and shoot all right, dude, you know what I'll do um, next time I have a class in North Carolina, which probably in 2023. We have a big conference coming up in uh, Nashville, but um, I'll fucking hit you up on the way down. No question about it. Yeah, I'd love to come hang out. Freaking listen to what all you guys do and stuff. And, yeah, dude, and I will. Um, if I can. Bro, if you want to if you want to come to the conference, it's a full invite for free. It's going to be badass. Um, and some of our guests are we have Tommy Lyron from Fox News. We have Kyle Carpenter. He's coming. We have Rob uh, O'Neill. We have Jason Redman. You know Jay, right? Yeah, hell yeah, Jay, yeah. Jay Redman's coming. We have a lot of we have big line. We have uh, Sheriff Wayne Ivy, Sheriff uh, David Clark. We have Sheriff American cool. Sheriff Mark Lamb, and uh-huh. we'll have five days some badass speaking and some real cool yeah. shit going what on. So if you want to come, April twenty third to the twenty eighth. Oh yeah, actually twenty eighth. April twenty. You I mean you can come for two days. Dude. I'm actually going to be in Pennsylvania the twenty eighth and 29th for a long range class. Um, but those days but dude, prior. I'll circle back. That's too easy. I could go. Yeah. Bro, hey. come down. People know who you are. You can chop it up, shoot the shooting yeah. for a couple of days to Monday, Tuesday. Hey, yeah, man. I, like I said, man, freaking, I'm always trying to get out there and, and, and do whatever I can to support you guys. Oh yeah. yeah. Shit, brother. All right, Hell man. Yeah. It's great having you. Thank you so much on behalf of law enforcement community. Yeah. 
Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.